Welcome to Sister Power. I'm Sharon Thomas Yarbrough. Today, Sister Power is excited about having a conversation with Stogie Kenyatta, The World is My Home, The Life of Paul Robinson. Having performed to sold-out audiences on stages, in theaters, and U.S. embassies in 16 countries around the world, writer, actor, comedian Stogie Kenyatta's acclaimed one-man Broadway-style show will premiere in Honolulu for one weekend only, February the 1st and February the 2nd, at the Doris Duke Theater, Honolulu Museum of Art. Kicking off Black History Month, The World Is My Home, The Life of Paul Robeson is presented by Sisters Empowering Hawaii, Hawaii's foremost women's empowerment organization. Stogie and Alan Bryson, welcome to Sister Power. Oh, thank you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm joining you from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Fort Lauderdale, you were in Barbados recently, right? Yes, absolutely. I performed in Barbados. It's opening up my film, um, Joseph, that I did in Ghana and uh, Jamaica last summer. And uh, it pre world premiered was in Barbados. And um, on the 24th, which I believe is tomorrow, it opens in Ghana, Nigeria, and all of West Africa. That's fabulous. And I want our viewers, our new viewers, to meet a new member to Sisters in Parang Hawaiian. Alan Bryson is our marketing director. Welcome, Alan. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. All Great. is well. All is well. I'm all is well. To all well, the new. Good, good. Thank you. Well, we're so excited, Stogie, about the one man show that would be premiering here at Hawaii, uh, February the 1st and February the 2nd. And, you know, let's just chat a bit about who is Paul Robinson. Tell us about this superstar. Uh, well, Paul Robeson is uh, America's um, first Renaissance man. Uh, he's the son of a slave, born 1898, um, and uh, was the third African-American to get an academic scholarship at the Rutgers University. He graduated in 1919, magna cum laude and valedictorian, and then um, went on to Columbia University Law School and passed the New York State Bar in 1922 and became the very first Negro attorney hired by a Manhattan law firm. He spoke 15 languages. He performed globally. He was an actor as well. He was an All-American football player. He played football and basketball. Um, and he was the ultimate uh, Renaissance man because he was both left brain and right brain. And he was the paradigm for African-American success, succeeding in all the areas in which made African-Americans wealthy and famous which was athletics, entertainment, law, and social justice. Um, he's an amazing individual and way ahead of his time. Wow, that is he, amazing. Alan, what questions do you have for Mr. Kenyatta? Mm. Well, the first question I wanna ask is, what led to this, this play? What led to you becoming Paul Robeson on stage? Uh, well, uh, the very first time I did it, um, uh, in the late 90s, uh, it was on Broadway with James Earl Jones in the 70s. And it had a successful Broadway run there with James Earl Jones and Lloyd Richards directing it. And later, um, uh, the gentleman who played a man called Hawk, Avery Brooks, he did it as well on Broadway and Danny Glover. And they did a Broadway version of the show. Uh, when I was offered to do the show, um, it was because Robert Guillaume, who was supposed to do it um, at a, a university, uh, he got Phantom of the Opera. He was on the study, and they brought him in to take over the lead in Phantom oh. of the Opera. So the job fell wow. to me. I rewrote this play because it had 16 songs in it, and it focused more on the politics of the time. And I knew for a college audience, you needed to tell the entire story. So I tell it chronologically. So if you come in knowing absolutely nothing about Robeson, you will meet him at five years old, and you can follow the story from there. Uh, what's unique and what led me to it is that he's the most unique of all of our uh, African-American heroes. Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Frederick Douglass, Du Bois, they all made huge contributions, but they had lives that I would not want. It was too much work. It was too much sadness and too much suffering. Robeson played sports. He sang, he acted, and he did all of those things. And he was just a combination. It was as if Michael Jordan or Muhammad Ali 
went to law school, became a lawyer, and then started a Broadway play and um, became a great singer as well. Wow. That was what mm. Robeson was. He was Joe Lewis, Nat King Cole, Martin Luther King, Jack Johnson, all rolled into one, and Thurgood Marshall. And so he was, like I said, the paradigm for African-American success. Yes. Well, you know, we're having it, your one man show at the Doris Duke Theater. And why does using theater as a vehicle for social change mean? And why is that important to you? Uh, the question was, why, why is it? Why does, it using, why, you, why does using theater as a vehicle for social change? Oh, uh, that um, using theater as a vehicle for social change is vitally important because Education has changed, and right now, uh, Robeson is not known to a lot of people. And the thing is, the greatest influence on young people today has been the arts and culture and music, and so you learn more through that. And so uh, introducing him this way and using, um, we, society has made it easier to kill. You can learn how to blow up a bomb online, how to build a bomb, you have anthrax, which you can't smell or taste, but in 12 seconds after touching your skin, it'll kill you. Um, you have poisonous gases. And so technology has made it easier to take human life. And so what happens is that we need to develop a new generation that instinct, in, intrinsically understands that just because technology says you can doesn't mean you should. And to do that, you have to develop more than reading, writing, and arithmetic. You have to develop the soul. And what theater does is it forces you to laugh and to cry and to touch and become a part of this common yet shared humanity. Oh, that's one. We were just looking at some of your performances, looking at your pictures. And I know this is an, as a laugh out loud funny as it is educational. This romanticized love story with a toe tapping jazz and bebop soundtrack features music from the Harlem Renaissance. This is exciting for Honolulu and the Harlem Renaissance. Tell us more about the 12 characters that you would be playing with colorful props and wardrobe changes. Well, I play 12 characters because um, throughout the piece, even though it's about Robeson, there are people like Cab Calloway, Fats Waller, um, uh, Jack Johnson, and people that all share in it because they were part of his life and they're part of the soundtrack of his life. And so, no one lives in a vacuum. And since uh, Jim Crow and segregation forced black people to only buy from and sell to each other and play and party in, in, in a segregated society, we were intermixing. And so the talent became really concentrated. And so they were all influenced by each other. And so um, it, it becomes vitally important because without the Harlem Renaissance, you learn through the Harlem Renaissance that indigenous Africans and descendants of enslaved Africans invented and created every single form of music on the planet Earth except opera and classical. Mm. That's a tremendous statement for one ethnic group, mm -hmm. a minority ethnic group, to lay that cultural claim on not just America, but the globe. So whether it's jazz, mm. which is the father of, uh, of, of, um, of blues and, and, and soul and fusion and rock and roll and R&B, and soul and gospel and country and reggae and soca and calypso, all of those have their origin. With the exception of opera and classical, everything ever created that you ever sing is created by the genius and the creativity of the African in America and around uh, the world. That's mm -hmm. just, mom, this is just absolutely wonderful. This gives me um, all mm -hmm. kind of chills and I'm so excited for this one man show and I want to immediately thank some of our sponsors for the one man show. Uh, I would like to thank Evolve Theater, the Doris Duke Theater of course, Gym of Events, uh, Dr. James McCoy and Dr. Joanne Williams Lazoya and Aqua Aston Hospitality. And we, Honolulu is excited about this one man show that will be happening. Tell us the dates of the, of the event, Alan. Mm. And uh, where? The event's, going to be, <laughs> the event's going to be February 1st and 2nd at the Doris Duke Theater, um, Honolulu Museum of Art. 
located at 900 South uh, Barantania Street, uh, very close to the Bladesdale. If you've ever been there to see Janet Jackson or any of the greats perform at the Bladesdale, it's, it's uh, a few minutes walk. Absolutely. And so we are there and the tickets are $35. And what I like about this Stogie, this event is suitable for all ages. So talk about, talk to the parents to bring their children and aunts and grandparents. Yes, absolutely. Um, from ages 14 and up, uh, it's suitable for all ages. Uh, there's no profanity in it at all. It, it, it's a PG because now some people uh, have said, Will the content be too extreme uh, for young people? And I point out to them that that's a luxury that no one has. Whether 9-11, which is one of the most traumatic things for our generation, where over 3,000 Americans died in 9-11 in, in when uh, the towers came down. And the violence, school shootings, all of these things are way more mm injurious to young people than anything that will happen on stage. What, what bringing young people do is they will get to see uh, Paul Wilson at five years old. I play him as a young boy. He deals with some of the young people, the things that they deal with right now. Um, and uh, tragedy, grief, suffering, loss of a parent, loss of a loved one to war or police act um, shooting or anything that is a part of this milieu called life. Uh, it's the price we pay to be here that we are going to feel, and it gives you a chance to learn how to deal with it. You can't dress for her as tragedy, but you can, to some degree, prepare for a compassionate response to tragedy because that's what it is. And there's an old Shakespearean quote that says, it's only when nature touches the face of mankind that we all become kin. Uh, Anytime there's a hurricane, a tornado, a huge fire, a volcanic eruption or something, which does not discriminate, it takes the rich and the poor, the young and the old, the good and the bad, the wicked, the, it doesn't matter. It takes humanity as it is. And only then do we realize how fully connected we are, that we are one people. One of the themes of the show is if we accept the fatherhood of God, then we must accept the brotherhood of man. It's a simplified version of saying, if he's your father's son, and she's your father's. She's your, she's your father's daughter. Then she immediately becomes your sister. And we say that if we all call God the Father, then all of His children are brothers. And that is the thing that you know, that to try to get men to live as brothers. And so that's the universal message for Robeson, and it is clearly and still our only hope for humanity. Well, that's wonderful. We're about to take a quick break, but I, we are talking about the young people coming in, and Paul Robeson spoke out against racism and became a world activist, and he was a star athlete and uh, academic, the third African American to attend Rutgers University. So when we come back, we're going to talk about him being an athlete and you being an actor and comedian and writer. And I, this is the place, February the 1st and February the 2nd, that anyone who has a passion for acting, has a passion for comedy, this is a place to be at the Doris Duke Theater on February the 1st and February the 2nd, and we'll be right back. Stay tuned. Hey, aloha everyone, and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studio. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii. We air here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Hawaii time, trying to bring you issues about security that you may not know, issues that can protect your family, protect yourself, protect our community, protect our, our companies, the folks we work with. Uh, please join us, and I uh, hope you can um, maybe get a little different perspective on how to live a little safer. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Duration. You are watching Think Tech Hawaii. I will be hosting a show here every other Wednesday at 1 p.m. And we will be talking to a lot of experts and guests around sustainability, social justice, the future here in Hawaii, progressive politics, and a whole lot more. So please tune in and thank you for watching Think Tech Hawaii.
Welcome back to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, and we are so excited about the one-man show, and we have Stogie Kenyatta joining us here from Fort Lauderdale, but he, he lives in Los Angeles, and he is coming here to do the one-man show, The World is My Home, The Life of Paul Robeson, and also we have joining us, and there's a flyer right in front of you at the Doris Duke Theater, and we also have Alan Bryson, Sisters in Park Hawaii's marketing director. Welcome, welcome, gentlemen. Before we went to break, we were talking about the famous Paul Robinson. And, and Alan, just, you know, you are just only 28 years old and you've learned so much about Paul Robinson. Tell us about, tell us about your takeaway. I'm just, I mean, when I hear the story of Paul Robinson, what I've done my personal research on and heard Stogie say, I'm just, sometimes I get baffled that one person can do so much in one life. Like, uh, I mean, he's, he was, of course, he was married for 44 years to Eslanda. And throughout that time, I mean, uh, I mean, he went to Rutgers University, the third African-American, like um, Stokey Kenyatta said, and graduated, went to law school. And um, if my research is correct, they said on the weekends while he was in law school at Columbia U, he played professional football and taught Latin. So I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm just trying to wrap my head around just, just uh, <laughs> how can one person, you know, do so many things? And uh, he speaks 12 languages. That's a rabbit hole there. Like, how can you speak over 12 languages? And, and who are you talking to? And what are you talking about? <laughs> and, and so it's just like, um, it's just like Stogie Kenyatta said about the left brain and the right brain. He was definitely an intellect. He was a thinker. He was a deep thinking. He was he was a deep person, but he was also a very colorful, artistic person. So, I mean, uh, for those who are fortunate enough to meet Paul Robeson, I think he was he has something for everybody. He, he could talk to everybody because he could, you know, I'm pretty sure he knew something about computers and he knew probably just as much about <laughs> sports. So. <laughs> but that's well, really cool. That's really cool. It is cool. Was well, just was well, Stogie, take it away because you are playing this fantastic human being. Yeah, you see, uh, that is magnificent about it. And a lot of people ask me, they say, um, well, when we do Q and A's, uh, when, when they ask about how is he able to have done so much and achieved so much, it's as though he lived two lifetimes. And the thing is, is that without the distraction of TV and, mm. you know, video games and all the things that consume us today, you have to because you do know that you're representing an entire generation. And life was short then because during Paul Robeson's lifetime, you had World War I and you had World War II. Between those two wars, world global wars, we had 97 million dead. Of the 97 million dead people, 70 million of those were civilians that were not involved with the war. So what you knew growing up with then was that life was short and life was cheap. And I mean that globally, not just across the world, here in America. It was uh, March, on or about March 23rd, somewhere in the New Mexico desert, the United States for the very first time tested the atom bomb. Within 12 days later, by April 6th, I mean August 6th, they dropped it on Hiroshima, killing almost 400,000 people in 12 minutes. Mm. Two days later, they dropped another one on Nagasaki. And of course, that ended the war because if they didn't get to the phone, they was like, listen, whatever you do, whatever, we're, we're done, we're not fighting anymore. And I say that to say that it was as though you got a brand new toy and you couldn't, or a hat and you couldn't wait to wear it. Human life was cheap. The thing that you think that if you, when could you get the entire globe to get together and say, let's choose slides and don't kill our brothers. They did that not once, but twice, global world wars. So that being said, young people and people living under that social criteria knew that tomorrow isn't promised me. I have to do everything today. And Robeson approached life that way because as descendant of slaves and knowing that he was three-fifths of a man and it was not against the law to kill him, he approached mm. life with that zest. And once mm. he got to Europe and he saw that the French and the Swedes in different countries did not live and have the same ideology as me, he said, I wanted to learn to talk to those people. So while he was in London, 
he went to the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies and he studied linguistics and he learned about all these different languages and he studied them. And that's how you know he was a genius because he learned so many languages after the age of 20. And he became good friends with Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, and Namdi Ezekiwe. And Namdi became the president of Nigeria. Um, Jomo Kenyatta became the president of Kenya and Kwame Nkrumah became the president of Ghana. And the three of them, along with W.E.B. Du Bois, formed the OAU, the Organization of African Unity, because he had a vision for a unified Africa. They're phenomenal men that did so much in a short lifetime. It shows how, you know, and uh, the only parallel to uh, Robeson that I thought did so much in a short lifetime would have to have been Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, because both of them died before their 39th birthday. And when you think that in 39 years, Malcolm Martin Luther King not only went to college and got a degree and got a doctorate, he married what had to be the most beautiful woman in the 60s uh, or the 50s, Coretta Scott King, and he had five babies with her. So he had an active home life mm -hmm. and he had a beautiful wife and he did all of that. And still at 26 years old, brought down the Alabama uh, racist segregated bus system. So it's a phenomenal achievement by phenomenal men. And it's one of the reasons why we are who we are in such an amazing race of people. Oh, I, you know, I, you can go on and on. You're such a great storyteller, uh, Stokey. What is the connection to Robinson, the Obamas and the state of Hawaii? Oh, that's a wonderful question because, um, uh, I often say when people ask me, how is this show so important to me? I said, because Paul Robeson has proved that one person can make a tremendous difference, even if that one person is not around to see the difference that they made. And I say right after that, without Paul Robeson, we would have never had Barack Obama as president. Now, a lot of people think, well, that's a bit of a stretch because they never met. But then I explained to them that Robeson was the most influential artist of his time. And as so, he mentored some younger artists. Among them, his number one mentee was a great Jamaican, Harry Belafonte, and his best friend, Sidney Poitier. When him and Bo Bojangles Robinson tried to get uh, a black player in Major League Baseball, the best black player in the Negro Leagues was Jackie Robinson. He lived in Pasadena, California. He was the son of a Texas, Louisiana slave, grandson of a Texas, Louisiana slave. They came here. So the three of them became his primary mentees, Sidney Poitier, Belafonte, and uh, Jackie Robinson. Robinson taught his mentees several things, among them three things in particular. Number one, he taught him education was the number one way to advance in a society. He said, educated people do less harm to their fellow, fellow citizens. The second thing he taught him was that the continental African and the African in America were one people. And the third thing he said that was successful African Americans have a moral and a cultural obligation to try to get a quality education for qualified African students. So in 1959, Belafonte, Sidney Poitier, and Jackie Rump started a foundation to pay for college for qualified African students but they first had to find a university that would do so. All of the local in the lower 48 said, no, thank you, we don't want Africans coming here, no matter who's paying for them. So, but our newest state was Hawaii. And Hawaii said, well, we haven't been part of America long enough to learn how to hate anybody. And we're kind of brown ourselves. So if you, if you want, you can bring them here. And the more you bring, the bigger the discount. So Belafonte, Poitier, and Jackie Robinson went off to Africa, started in West Africa, went to Central Africa, all the way to East Africa. The requirements were, you must be a high school graduate, speak fluent English, and pass a college entrance examination test. They brought 72 students from 18 African nations, and they flew them all to the University of Hawaii to study. Among them was none other than a brilliant boy from the mountainsides of Kenya, and his name was none other than Barack Obama. And that was how, and while he was at Hawaii, he met um, uh, Anne, they, and when she was, they dated, they fell in love, she got pregnant. When she was three months pregnant, they got married, and Barack Obama, the global economic student from the mountainsides of Kenya, named his firstborn son on Hawaiian soil in America, Barack Hussein Obama. Oh, oh. there you, people, viewers, there you have it. Who would not want to come out Saturday, February the 1st at 7 p.m., and we have a matinee Sunday, February the 2nd at 4 p.m. at the Doris Duke Theater. It's only $35 per person. And I want the lovers out there to know this is a way to jumpstart Valentine's Day by bringing mm -hmm. the family, 
grab your best friend, grab your wife, grab your husband, and come out and contact Sisters in Park Hawaii at gmail.com or please call us at 808 808- Two two eight seven eight zero two, and in thirty seconds or less, Stogie, leave us a tip why everyone in Hawaii needs to come to this show. Well, there'll also be um, a meet and greet uh, after the show. I come off the stage in full costume, and I will take pictures with the audience and uh, and different and sign programs and uh, answer questions. And um, uh, there's a full meet and greet afterwards. But it's a once in a um, uh, I've been to 16 countries in the world and I've never performed in Honolulu. So um, you're an integral part of the story because you gave us our very first African-American president and um, and he did so with such class and grace. And um, there's nature and then there's nurture. And it was Hawaii that nurtured President Obama. And you nurtured him with the gentleness, a grace, a style, and a humanity that's so amazing and we see how rare it is now with whom we have an impeached bigot in the white house and Mm. so the very fact that the state that by the time they count hawaii's votes the president has been decided not once in american history have we waited to see how hawaii voted before we knew who our president was and yet still you gave us our first african-american president it's a wonderful thing it shows a testament that it's not where you are it's who you are and that um quality and character does count and so um it's an honor and i'm looking forward to it and um there are more obamas out there and there are young people there that are looking for this and i often tell people when i speak at universities and do master classes i say you can't start a fire without a spark this show will be the spark that will ignite the wisdom the compassion and the intellect of many many young people there and it will be a satisfied thing for those um, and comforting to know that those that have been living right all along. So it's um, it's an amazing um, opportunity to use theater as a vehicle for social change. And we're the number one nation in the world, United States, not because of bombs and bullets, but because of arts and culture. And that is what Sisters in Power in Hawaii is doing. I'm honored that you guys have uh, chosen to bring me out. And I'm so looking forward to opening Black History Month in this new decade, 2020, here on a the home of our 50th state, Hawaii. Thank you very much, Stogie. We're so excited for your one-man show, Um, The World is My Home, The Life of Paul Robeson. Get your tickets, go to the Honolulu Museum of Arts. Aloha, and I just want to thank Heritage Painting and Waterproofing and some of our sponsors, Evolve Theater and Dr. James McCoy. Aloha. Aloha.